people think of money as a cold paper and pencil kind of thing, but money is actually a very emotional part of our lives. Most people don't realize how much our thoughts, feelings, and moods affect how we use money. Today, during our Wise Wisconsin Winter Series, we will talk about how we can use our hearts when we use our money. I'm Amanda Kostman, University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension Educator in Walworth County. And I'm Ruth Schriefer, an Extension Educator in Iowa County with the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. The tip or the part shown above the water is our state of health at this moment. This layer is a result of the layers beneath. It represents the part of our health and well-being that is felt and can be seen. These examples can be illness, pain, muscle tension, mood, energy levels, the amount of smiling we do, the amount of crying we might do, or the amount of sleep we're getting. This layer represents the sum or the outcome of the layers beneath. The first layer underwater represents our physical health which is often a result of our genetics or our lifestyle behaviors. For example, eating and physical habits, stress relief, sleeping patterns, substance use, all of these play a role in our physical well-being. Our lifestyle behaviors most directly affect our physical health, which affects our current state of health or the tip of the iceberg. Many of us struggle with maintaining a healthy lifestyle. For example, we struggle to eat healthier, engage in regular phys physical activity, or getting enough sleep. Often when we try to change these lifestyle patterns, we are successful at first, but then eventually we might fall back to our old habits. Have you ever wondered why it's so difficult to make such lifestyle changes in your life? To understand this, sometimes we have to look a little bit deeper at the next layer of the iceberg. The next layer is mental health and social health. This layer influences our lifestyle behaviors and subsequently our current state of health. Our mental health and social health are difficult to completely separate because they overlap in some ways. For example, having meaningful relationships with others helps us to cope with our emotions better. We're going to discuss two components of mental health. First, intellectual. This is the performance on mental functions or activities such as reading, writing, and communications. This is learning new things, creating new ideas and ways to do things. This could be solving problems, planning, analyzing situations, engaging in some of those challenging mental activities as well. There's also the emotional component. This is expressing our, commo our emotions, coping with emotions in a healthy way, adapting to change, dealing with adversity or challenges in our lives, and sometimes having a positive attitude and a positive self-concept. Social health relates to having fulfilling relationships with other people, having people to express our emotions with, people to share life's joys and letdowns with, enjoying doing things with other people, listening to others, and having others listen to you. If we are mentally healthy, we are more likely to be socially healthy. The bottom layer of the iceberg is known as the health of our spirit. It influences every layer above. Often we think of religion when we think of our spiritual health. Practicing a religion is one way to nurture our spiritual health, but there are many other ways to do this as well. Before we can identify other ways to nurture our health of our spirit, we need to first understand spiritual health. Having a healthy spirit entails living life with meaning and purpose, having that fulfilling life, living your life in harmony with your core values, guiding principles, beliefs, and ethics. A healthy spirit can be represented by feeling good about and caring about yourself and others. If we struggle with this layer, such as not living life or spending money in harmony with our values, struggles are likely to occur. The environment we live in and the culture we are part of affect all of the dimensions of health or layers of our iceberg. Our environment involves our surroundings, like our community, climate, neighborhood, and where we spend time, such as our home and workplace. Our cultural involves these groups of people we surround ourselves with and identify with, such as family, friends, and coworkers. This includes the group norms, beliefs, behaviors, and values. Both our environment and culture strongly influence all aspects of our health. This iceberg layer shows how every aspect is connected. It is difficult to change a lifestyle behavior without first digging deeper to find out what is causing you to struggle with adapting a healthy behavior or what's drawing you to a less healthy lifestyle. 
The goal of this program is to help you learn how to focus on these aspects of health, especially that spiritual health, that helps or hinders us in making healthy financial choices. Keep in mind what we discuss with the spiritual health. And now I want to talk about values. Values, in a narrow sense, is that which is good, desirable, or worthwhile. Values are the motive behind purposeful action. Here's a list of values that come up when people really boil them down. I'm going to ask you to look at this list, and I want you to find out which five do you hold dearest. Now, these are your values, not anybody else's. Don't should on yourself, or I should say this, or I could say this. Really think about what you value in and of yourself. Take a moment, pause this video if you need to, and really think about that. Then I'd like you to rank them one through five. And I want you to think about how do these values come through and how you spend your money. Do you spend your money in a way that represent this value or maybe not? Think about it. Another way to think about what we value is come up with two lists. One of them might be life is too short to, and another would be life is short not to. These two lists are a way that you can narrow down what's really important to you and what you really want out of life. Because we do want to make sure that we take these in consideration financially when we think about our short, medium, and long-term goals. Keeping our values in mind when we come up with these goals is going to really help us to stick to those goals and be successful. Another topic we discuss on our Wise Wisconsin Winter Series is joy. And joy plays into how we use our money as well. Remembering a happy moment releases in our brain the same feel-good chemicals that flood it at the time of the actual experience. We can practice mindfully recalling favorite memories as a strategy to help us achieve our goals, including those financial goals. Cultivating optimism, alleviating negativity, priming our brains for learning new materials, generating ideas from past experiences, and boosting our physical health all help us financially. I'd like to invite you to create a joy list. On your joy list, you should include items that make you happy, you are passionate about, that bring you joy, that give you energy, that inspire you, and that elevate your mood. These things could be included in your financial planning. There are things that you wanna do and help you get to that goal that you want to achieve. I want you to think about how you use these resources money as well as other resources like time, energy, and attention. How is what you noted on your lists reflected or not in how you use your resources? This could be your joy list and it could be your values list. How is what you noted in your lists reflected or not in how you use your money on a daily basis? We can think about and make all the lists we want, but if we don't use them, they aren't really useful. Ruth is going to talk about how we keep these in mind. So what is mindlessness? Mindlessness is like being on automatic pilot. You might be preoccupied with memories, fantasies, plans, or maybe worried or just behaving automatically without really being aware of your actions. Mindlessness could also be a separation from self, like denial, avoidance, or a sense of just sleepwalking through life. Think about all of the things you've worried about and all the time you've spent worrying that really didn't come true. What we're really striving for is mindfulness. Being mindful of what is actually happening while it's happening. Being aware of the present moment on purpose in a non-judgmental way. Various forms of meditation are formal ways of practicing mindfulness. Mindfulness is being aware of our thoughts, emotions, and sensations, and accepting them as they are without criticizing or judging them. Mindfulness is all about being intentional. So why practice mindfulness? Well, we know that stress can be caused by things that are happening externally and internally. And mindfulness is about responding versus just reacting. 
think about external stress caused by things from the outside of ourselves, such as things that happen to us from others, the environment, or life situations. Think about the slides Amanda showed on the iceberg of health and those external factors that can cause stress. Internal stress is caused by our own thoughts and emotions. Internal stress is a result of our reactions to those external stressors. Let's put it all together. The iceberg of health, values, mindfulness, Money by the heart is mindfully using your money. It's lifestyle-based money management and it's conscious and intentional spending. Money by the heart uses emotions to create sustainable, satisfying money management. There are four considerations that will break down on the following slides, but they include thinking about why you buy, evaluating your spending, shifting your mindset, and changing your habits. Understanding why you buy is related so closely to your values, your emotions, and your habits. One of the reasons people buy is out of convenience. Whatever it is, it's accessible, you can use it, you like it. Rather than just immediately spending, Think about focusing on your goals, and if you made one, sticking to your list. Retail therapy, spending because it feels good. If you're working on avoiding retail therapy, how about trying the 48 hour rule? If you see it and you like it, can you wait 48 hours before you actually buy it? Give yourself that challenge. It might really help reduce impulse buying. Another strategy to work toward retail therapy is starting a wish list. If you see something and you like it, put it on your wish list. Review that list occasionally, especially when there's something new that you're interested in purchasing. And really decide how you want to use your money. Maybe some things on your wish list go to the bottom so that other priorities can be at the top. And finally, advertising. Advertising has so much to do with how we spend our money, but be sure to do your math. Just because it's on sale doesn't mean it's a good deal. How about evaluating your spending? We're gonna talk about tracking it, wanting it or needing it, or freezing it. Tracking your spending. There are so many methods to accomplish this task. Just do a search on the computer or the old fashioned way, paper and pencil. Write down or note everything you spend for a week or two weeks or better yet, a whole month. At the exercise of tracking your spending can really be eye-opening and help point out where your money is going and putting you back in control of it if that's your priority. Do you want it or do you need it? This really varies by the individual, but it is something to consider. Wants and needs are all about being mindful. And finally, how about trying a spending freeze? This is another opportunity for a personal challenge. Can you go a day or a week and only spend money on your needs? How about trying that for a whole month to see what it does to the bottom line? Shift your mindset. Think about alternatives before you make a purchase. What happens if you do spend? Or what happens if you don't spend? That's mindfully using your money. Simplify or minimize. If you see something you're interested in purchasing, take a closer look. Do you love it? Will you use it? Where will you put it? 
And will you value it a day, a week, a month, or even years from now? And finally, talk about it. Money conversations are hard, but they're so very important. You could have a money conversation with a spouse, a partner, a family member, a close friend. What we know is that if your personal network is on board, they can help to hold you accountable for your spending goals. The fourth consideration is changing your habits. Start with a plan. Set your goals. Create a budget or spending plan to work toward them. What about an allowance? Allowances aren't just for children. If you can set an amount for discretionary spending, that's something that you can use for whatever you choose during the month. And consider additional accounts, special savings accounts, automatic transfers, an account just for your fixed expenses. Explore options with your financial institution or talk to family and friends for some suggestions that have worked for them. We hope you've enjoyed this session on putting your money where your heart is. We've learned about the iceberg of health. We identified values, joys, and priorities. We considered how mindfulness can help move you toward your goals. And now it's time to be intentional with how you use your money.